founding director of the Institute of Women's Studies at Birze University in Palestine. And you have also been for so many years the director there that it's a great pleasure to have you. Uh, Eileen is also a founding member of the Arab Council for Social Science, ACSS, and uh, heads the focal point of ACSS in Ramallah. And uh, her research interests are very broad, and the publications do focus on feminism, nationalism, on social movements, especially the Palestine women's movement, also from a historical perspective, which is very interesting how you combine the different disciplinary perspectives as well in your publications. Also publications criticizing the mainstream of gender and development and contextualizing the concept of women's empowerment under colonial colonialization. What, what I think is very impressive is that you are also an activist which influence and which can be seen when looking at your academic work, how this comes together and how your activism is embedded in your academic work and probably also the other way around. She has served on different boards of women, grassroots organizations, development institute and human rights organizations. And a last point I would like to mention is that she was the first and only woman in Palestine to be elected as head of the Union of Faculty and Employees at Birze University and they are successfully integrating gender issue in the university's administrative framework. And if anybody is interested to learn more about her publications and her work, there's a lot which can be found online. And of course, everybody is free to do so. Eileen, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation and I would say we could start the floor or the space is yours and thanks for joining today. Thank you Petra, thank you Bastien. I'm very honored also to be part of this association, the European Association of Development and I thank them for inviting me to this special lecture to share with you the complexity of the Palestinian context with a particular focus on women. Analyzing a context uh, really where in Palestine you have to address three powers, namely colonization, neoliberalization and patriarchy, as they have all have met in an interrelated package to subjugate and disempower vulnerable groups particularly women, through militarization, privatization, and exploitation. At the same time, I would like to expose how women's resistance to these powers have managed to a certain limit to change some gender roles and gender dynamics through their continuous commitment to enhance steadfastness of their households and create innovative strategies for coping on the social and economic levels. <clears throat> now, before I start with my presentation, I found it necessary conceptually to touch on the global scene after witnessing the outburst of political, racial and economic struggles of the poor and vulnerable economic groups and minorities around the world, especially in the last decade, particularly in rich countries, which suggest that there is something chronically wrong. As David Harvey puts it, on one hand, it can be traced to a failure in democratic governance, and alienation from political practice, and on the other, a breakdown of the dominant economic neoliberal model that has failed to create a satisfying and decent life for its people. 
One recent example we all experienced is the crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic, which exposed the inadequate, inadequate health services, especially of the rich countries that failed to prepare and protect their nations as well as other countries and caused misery and pain to a large sector of the societies. Mostly vulnerable groups who have been ill-treated on the basis of race, class, and gender. These struggles clearly represent a level of discontent with the politics of daily life. In terms of vital services, employment and political participation. Can these struggles promote new alternative model or can, or can have a human face? Or are these plans, are there any plans for reform is yet to be seen. Now, to focus on Palestine, <clears throat> it should be clear that addressing Palestine we should address colonialism, settler colonialism, and neoliberalism, which becomes uh, an inevitable framework for analysis. This unique, the uniqueness of Palestine, I may say, when compared to other nations, due to the Israeli military occupation that exceeded now 73 years, and of a settler colonial nature, package a combination of chronic factors of structural, political, economic, and ideological in nature that seek to control space, resources, and people, not only by occupying land, but also by establishing an exclusionary and apathetic regime. Sarah Roy has remarked on the inadequacy of prevailing theories of dependency and underdevelopment in understanding the uniqueness of the Palestinian situation. How would existing theories, I quote, explain the political repression of the Palestinians, the harassment of educational institutions, the discriminatory application of economic policy, the denial of legal protection, the destruction of personal property, the deportation of Palestinian leadership, the imprisonment of activists, and the arbitrary use of power. Development theories usually identify dominance, inequality, and exploitation as reasons for underdevelopment. They fail to account for disposition and destruction of production and resources as the principal reason for underdevelopment. Roy continues to say that underdevelopment no longer is motivated by just economic imperatives, but rather by political and ideological ones too. She has developed an alternative concept of de-development to capture all dimensions of a settler colonial occupation where an indigenous economy is controlled by a dominant one, where economic and societal potentials are not only distorted, but denied. This, if imagined in reality, can summarize why Palestine under colonial occupation has no chance to comprehensive real development. In such a context, the only development that can be developed is a resistance economy, where on one hand, it responds to basic needs for survival, and on the other, protect and sustain the Palestinian households to steadfast. Saying this, then, any genuine development that entails a better livelihood through community participation and empowerment of marginalized groups is constrained structurally and challenged politically within a state ideology of repression and disposition. Now, the story does not end here. 
another face of the coin are the Palestinians who by signing the Oslo Accords in 1993 between the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, and the Israeli government, suddenly shifted the Palestinian economy into a market economy, privatizing social sectors, mainly education and health, embracing a formal strategy of state building based on the two-state solution with crucial and strategic issues like Jerusalem, right of return and self-determination postponed for future negotiations. And the policy of total neglect of productive sectors, mainly agriculture and small industries, which if enhanced could have generated employment and satisfied the needs of the local market. This accord have, gener have generated employment and satisfied the needs. This accord has contradicted the existing reality of the military occupation, despite the fact that such an agreement will never result in a Palestinian sovereign state, nor can a quasi autonomy, which was established, liberate land and people from occupation nor can it stop daily resistance against the occupation or bring security and political stability. The accord reproduced clear socioeconomic inequalities and class polarization, further dependency on the Israeli economy, a process of co-option of the Palestinian fragile economy into the global market as a precondition to qualify the Palestinian Authority, the PA, to become legitimate for financial support by global actors. A full denial of Palestinian sovereignty and territorial integrity and a compromise on self-determination. Now, to some analysts like Adam Haniye, the Oslo Accords has served as an instrument to consolidate and deepen structures of occupation engraved by Israeli colonialism. While to others like Iqbal Ahmed, it revealed Israel from its, it relieved Israel from its duties towards the occupied population enabled the entrenchment of Zionist settler colonialism and institutionalized an upper side system. This has transformed the West Bank and Gaza Strip into Bantustans. In addition to the accord, I should also mention an additional factor to solidify the implementation of the peace plan, which was the international aid. It has become an instrument of neoliberalization and an important actor to conceal the absence of a real political process. So the question becomes, what kind of development can people choose when all choices are governed by the objectives of the peace process stabilizing the peace process, more control of Israeli economy over the territories, ensuring the promotion of a neoliberal market economy based on privatization and dependency, a recipe for further marginalization of vulnerable groups, including women. It was clear that by endorsing a neoliberal approach by the PA for development on the basis that it is the only solution for promoting economic growth necessary to boost the economy and resolve the structural constraints of the long occupation represent a short-sighted and alienating decision. Now, the complex conditions and parameters of the Palestinian economy within the political reality of Israel's ongoing occupation 
land expropriation, expansion of settlements, the establishment of an upper side wall. All this, the PA's limited jurisdiction, absence of sovereignty, inability to protect property rights, are all important prerequisites for economic growth, and all these are totally absent and not available. So, a third factor also that hinders the improvement of the status of women is patriarchy. Of course, patriarchy is, is uh, mainly a structural hindrance and exploitation of Palestinian women, in particular in reaching their aspirations and re realizing gender equality. It's an institution that historically positioned women at the bottom of the social pyramid and isolated and discriminated against them through the kind of economic model adopted that marginalized producers in general and especially women. In addition to the restrictions by traditional values and norms that define the parameters of their existence. But unlike Arab women, the liberation struggle expanded women's spaces in the public domain as they had to play important roles in the national movement which gave them legitimate space to exit and face the constraints of patriarchy, making the private and public relatively inseparable. However, it's important to mention that when addressing the concept of patriarchy, one mechanically link it to a cultural and religious explanations. Yet theoretically, it is significant to articulate patriarchy not as an original authentic concept within the Arab culture, but a historical culmination of various economic formations, including the capitalist formation, which implies that the concept and practice have not been invented or created in the Arab region, rather is a result of an economic model that has historically excluded, exploited, and discriminated against women. In the Palestinian context, it's important to mention that during the last two decades, it is observed that patriarchy as an institution has been shaken as patriarchs Patriarchs have lost their absolute power due to economic transformations. The occupation policies of destruction, the capabilities of production, and liberalization of Palestinian economy have created structural poverty and unemployment, weakening and dismantling the patriarchal extended household into a nuclear family, which in turn affected the gender relation and gender dynamics within the family. At the same time, the concept of the male breadwinner has been redefined as women's participation in economic activities have become either complementary to, to the men or substitute in certain circumstances which opened new opportunities for the women, for women's social and economic empowerment in terms of visibility, family income, and participation in strategic decisions. However, like other Arab women, Palestinian women are still discriminated against by traditional patriarchal institutions in varying degrees depending on their level of education, social status, class, and region, or locale, in our context, the rural, urban, refugee camp. Yet, due to the participation of the Palestinian women in the national struggle against occupation, they have better grounds to be empowered compared to the Arab women, especially those of the Gulf countries, as the national struggle 
impose a level of social transformation in terms of participation and representation. So in the case of Palestine, the, the, the coalition of power made up of Israel as a settler colonial occupation, which strengthened politically traditional institutions like village councils, security forces through their coordination, and the private sector through class interests have all met to subjugate social vulnerable groups, and in particular, women. Furthermore, privatization of social sectors like education and health as core elements of neoliberalization and the intentional neglect and destruction of the agricultural sector by Israel and the PA, which could have generated employment and promoted self-reliance and food sovereignty, if developed, have compromised the popular and resistance economy, and thus in that marginalized and disempowered all vulnerable groups, but particularly women in agriculture. Now, despite the above, all the above obstacles and the power of the coalition, Palestinians and Palestinian women are facing continuous aggression through different informal political and economic activities, which in turn expand popular authority, boundaries, and space of vulnerable groups. By engaging women in the formal and informal economic activities, women are able to enhance sustainability and survival of their households. They're able to keep up with the national struggle requirements in promoting household survival and steadfastness, which present them as active actors and agents for change. They show creativity and innovation in promoting and managing coping strategies, especially in the uprisings of 1987 and 2000, which made their private and public lives inseparable. Of course, this does not mean that through their exposure and participation, gender dynamics and relations within the household or in the labor market or in the political arena have changed dramatically as women always bear the brunt of the conflict and aggression, but there are signs of change that if accumulated can make a difference. Now to analyze further the levels of discrimination, I have chosen labor force as one of the indicators. As women participation in the labor force is based on occupational segregation due to the rooted phenomena of feminization of jobs. So they are either concentrated in agriculture as seasonal and domestic workers or employed in the public or private sectors with wage, wage gender difference little privileges and no security or social protection. In terms of women's participation in the labor force, it is one of the lowest in the region where the gap between the genders continue to grow larger and larger. The highest participation rate before the pandemic did not exceed 18% in 2019. In regard to the benefits and rights wage gap still continues on a gender basis. Women are paid less than the average minimum wage and most are still without contracts. In the private sector, I think the conditions are even worse. 35% of them get less than minimum wage and 25% without a contract. Less than half of female employees get only a maternity leave. While in the public sector, they are employed as clerical workers, representing the lowest level in the job hierarchy, and their work conditions and benefits are far better than the private sector. 
44% of total employees are women in the, in the public sector, and 13% of them are director general, which I think have taken higher positions in this sector, mainly by political affiliation to the mainstream members of the, and the political parties as part of the quota system. Hence, women as, are regarded as reserved and employed in jobs that are compatible to their reproductive roles. 11% of women are heads of households due to the absence of the breadwinner for different reasons, and they face the worst living conditions. An observation that I would like to mention is the fact that the more the women are educated, the less they are employed because of the nature of the existing labor market that is dependent mainly on unskilled labor in construction or other low-skilled jobs. More women are joining the informal sector now as an alternative employment opportunity due to the deteriorating socioeconomic conditions. Their work is seasonal with no benefits and contracts like little wages, insecure jobs with no social protection. Their work conditions are severe and risky, becoming an invisible form of exploitation and a new face of slavery. Another sector that really have employed women is the agriculture. As you see in the slide, the women's employment in agriculture, imagine, decreased from 30% to 5% post Oslo. Due to the Israeli continued control of most natural resources, borders and roads, which created structural restrictions and obstacles. The building of the separation wall, which separated women from their farms, the expansion of settlements and confiscation of agricultural land, in addition to the Israeli control of 80% of the water resources, have severely destroyed the agricultural sector and in turn marginalized women in agriculture. We should bear in mind that the Palestinian economy pre-67 and pre-Oslo was dependent mainly on small industries and agriculture, a basis for self-reliance. Women played a leading, a leading role in agricultural production, creating the concept of self-reliance as a model for a household. But the, the, the deterioration of agriculture has affected women's role negatively which also affected gender relations and dynamics within the household and in the national economy at large. At the same time, developing and supporting the agricultural sector was not a priority to the Palestinian Authority, which is indicated by the percentage of financial support in the PA's national budget not exceeding 3% compared to 30% support to security forces. One can assume that there is an intentional neglect by the PA to productive sectors, particularly to the agricultural sector, as international aid had no interest in supporting this sector. But a more valid reason is the political value of land, which has become a political, ideological, and security issue for Israel's ideology of expansion. All this have resulted in gradual shrinking of rural women's economic activities in agriculture. 
a low percentage of rural women now are working either as domestic workers or as wage agricultural workers in Israeli settlements around their villages with low salaries, severe working conditions, and no social protection. So although women's employment in the labor force is limited, it has given women some kind of political and economic empowerment through taking new roles, contributing to the family's income, consolidating resources, thereby creating new gender dynamics within the family, which permit them to share strategic decisions. Yet all this has not affected dramatically political representation and participation in the decision-making, national decision-making process. For instance, 14% of women are in councils of ministers only. 11% in the national council and 5% only in the central council, which is the cabinet, which emphasize still that women are still discriminated against. So the political system also is evolving around very weak left secular parties and authoritarian rule by the mainstream. In all this context, I also found aid as another political instrument for political alienation and hindrance for women. It has been realized also that most of the international development literature and practice of the post-Oslo employed progressive concepts like community participation, empowerment, sustainable development, social safety, net, safety nets, but not within the original transformative, distributive, or structural meaning, but in a very symbolic manner that embraced paradoxical connotation between original meanings of concepts and their practice. As these concepts originally expressed emancipatory tools for activists in the 60s and 70s of the last century, now they have become depoliticized, instrumental, and alienating as they accommodating neoliberal principles enhanced by engines like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and used to rationalize their policies, give them a human face and strip away the implications of dominance entailed in capitalism, racism, and patriarchy. In the case of the occupied territories, international donors have under US leadership spent tens of billions of dollars on Palestinian aid since 1993. That spending was in large part meant to help build the, the Palestinian institutions that will form the basis of a Palestinian semi-state, encourage free market, all with the end aim of fostering economic growth and peace building with Israel. In this context, the new in emerging phenomena of feminist NGOs led by the elite mushroomed during the early 90s and played a prominent and highly controversial role in sustaining the women's movement, which could have been a tool for, to lobby and pressure the Palestinian Authority. They were distinct from those of historic women's groups of the 1970s and 80s of last century, which were mass-based, decentralized, and their work was closely aligned 
with the needs of the national and women's liberation struggles. The expansion of women's NGOs or the NGOization and the advocacy of women's rights has become a dominant trend in the evolution of the Palestinian women's movement. They emerged in a context of absent democracy and indifference within the national movement regarding gender issues, as well as regarding the political process and peace agreement, hence found a suitable political environment to propose a new agenda and ensure the integration of gender issues in state building. More specialized and professional work have been developed to suit the transition and to qualify them for bilateral and multilateral funding. The new agenda was more oriented to policy and advocacy, which provided expertise to international and national organizations like the ministries. All this new political terrain has presented the women's movement and other social movements like the student movement, the workers' movement, the peasant movement with difficult dilemmas in terms of developing a strategy that can address both gender issues in the emerging semi-state, quasi-state, based on an international agenda and a local agenda expressing the real conditions of the majority of women under Israeli colonial oppression and in a neoliberal economy that does not link women's participation and practical and strategic needs and interests or is unable to enhance better livelihood to the majority of women. This situation has weakened the grassroots and what is left now is a scattered women's movement competing on financial support and compartmentalizing gender issues unable to form a coherent agenda and movement. Divisions within the women's movement are based on political choices and affiliations and relevance of agenda to the real situation. So who can represent the majority of women in responding to their needs will become the vanguard and model of, for women to follow. One last comment in this context is the alienation that resulted from the Oslo political process that resulted in total absence of transparency and accountability by the people to PS performance and economic model. It has become clear that development process is delinked from the agendas of social movements as more emphasis is on political issues, assuming that development is neutral and is not political. Politicizing development within the context of Palestine with all the different levels of complications has become very important if picked up by the broad masses of people as it represents the core issues of daily life. Even aid have not been effective in creating positive change as unemployment has continued with greater numbers and poverty has never been alleviated but expanded, which pose a legitimate question to the donors and not partners of what kind of aid has been granted and who benefited from it. Observations of what type of growth has been developed indicate that only economic activities in the services like the banking sector, communication sector, the construction sector have been major sectors of economic growth, which on one hand expanded the wealth of the rich and on the other marginalized further women, workers and peasants or in few words, 
the producers. In all this context, could there be an alternative development model to empower women? Of course, with all this hierarchy of powers. Historically, I can say that the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, had undertaken the process of democratizing the different social movements in the late 70s and 80s around issues of gender, health, agriculture, and labor market when different mass-based organizations became effective. In this context, different models of development by women were initiated that responded to urgent needs of the struggle. With the outbreak of the uprising in 1987, the Palestinian popular national leadership continued adopting the slogan of economic independence as an integral in component for national liberation, hence enhancing all productive forces, including women, to work for a creation of concrete prerequisites for a self-sufficient economy that represent the basis and infrastructure for a resistance economy. Hence, development projects stressed economic efficiency and offered services that emphasized social justice and equality as necessary principles for a participatory development. This strategy, known as Development for Liberation, was adopted by democratic grassroots and other mass-based organizations. Although some preferred to call it resistance economy, others called it popular economy to reflect people's active role in development. The national goal was still stressed politically to delink from the Israeli economy or market, which confirms Amartya Sen's analysis on development as freedom which he developed as a prerequisite for promoting individual as well as collective capability. In this context, <clears throat> one can say that the women's democratic mass-based organizations who adopted income generation and other activities as tools for development have at this stage transformed the strategy of resistance to a strategy for liberation and empowerment. Their objectives were twofold, to integrate marginalized productive forces like women, peasants, and youth in the development process and to, do, to de link from the Israeli economy and substitute Israeli goods. These models, if practiced now, as an alternative models of development can still be viable if there is a new leadership that's more committed to people's aspirations and is ready to face on one hand the everyday colonial practices and the neoliberal economic model substituting services at least at the local community level. These organizations have played a significant role in transforming the existing policies and concepts from steadfastness and survival into a more dynamic strategy of resistance and empowerment, making the approach a more dynamic strategy and integrating gender and class dimension as politicized strategic issues. Some of the above models of production received small grants and seed money, particularly from friends of partners who were supportive to these initiatives and in political solidarity with the Palestinian people. And some were supported by the women's committees themselves from revenues of services they offer. During the first intifada or the uprising, 
1987. Popular leaders and intellectuals in the occupied territories opposed the concept of charity on the grounds that it was an instrument for pacification that undermined people's independence, dignity, and collective will. One example that was creative in supporting the community was the voluntary work movement of the 1970s, which prefigured the first intifada and mobilized Palestinians on the basis of the nationalist principle of self-reliance. They began working with local communities to provide different services, including land reclamation, paving of roads, public sanitation, improving socioeconomic conditions for marginalized peripheries and refugee camps. They were very successful in offering alternative support for the communities and respond to their needs. An example that can be replicated to support this, the communities and offer basic services. Although the current situation, I should say, in, in, is much different than the 80s and 70s due to the closure and checkpoints policies or harassment of settlers, this model can be used in its concept as an alternative within each community in a decentralized method to substitute the existing models that are not responsive to people's needs. Another alternative <clears throat> that was employed by women in different uprisings and in different stages of the national struggle was income generating projects focusing on food and textile production to respond to some local needs of the vulnerable families and enhance steadfastness of producers. These projects were either initiated by the women's committees or other mass-based organizations and individual women who linked home and market in a household economy model. Most of these projects focused on agricultural produce to protect the land from confiscation, help in generating income, and urban settings also employed women in very poor urban settings and in rural areas. <laughs> These projects were also politically motivated as the leadership slogan was still include the, included the boycott of Israeli products. These projects succeeded in politicizing development and ensuring the delivery of services that respond to the community's basic needs. A more advanced model of income generation was the productive women's cooperative, which followed a new conceptual framework as a social and economic organization. It represented the cumulative experience of years of learning on how to organize production, production collectively based on principles of traditional peasant economy called alone or cooperation, still practiced in the olive harvest. It contributed to women's empowerment by perceiving development as self-governance and by catalyzing a process that promotes social change where the gender power relations between men and women can have a chance to transform positively. At the same time, new discourse emphasizing concepts like liberation, equality, social justice, women's liberation, respect of manual for manual labor, alternative development, resistance economy, appropriate technology, voluntary work, and empowerment as resistance were core concepts guiding the cooperative. Existing concepts with new content and meaning helped in guiding the different programs and projects designed to communicate these principles and concerns through practice 
creating a new model to capture a national discourse with social and gender concerns. These examples of development models promoted through local initiatives were very important in promoting wide participation in the development practice, at the same time reflected the importance of economic independence as an organic element of political independence, which the new Palestinian Authority still fails to recognize or does not want to do that. Women in these models were empowered, became the leading paradigm for these projects, reflecting the value of everyday survival strategies as acts of resistance towards liberation. Lastly, how can appropriate models of development become realistic and independent from intervention, occupation, the Palestinian Authority, and bad international aid. Building an alternative model within a colonial context and a neoliberal economic model is not easy, of course, and some people find it impossible as the challenges are risky and difficult to face and the process needs efforts and commitment in addition to political solidarity from local leaderships and foreign partners. Yet others see it possible, but still a challenge. I have just selected some points to May, to highlight these, some of these ideas. So is it possible to do that? When we remind ourselves, really, of how women worked in the different uprisings, we realize that funding was never an issue and it was not there. Women were engaged in political and development work, either as voluntary workers or with little salaries from women's institutions as part of their national duty. So one of the ways is to re-emphasize voluntary work as a concept and tool for practice, as it can be an important asset for transforming human energy into productive labor. Also, when cooperatives were established, the main principle that guided the cooperative was support to the peasants by getting their produce directly to the cooperative, minimize the control of the middleman, and limit the relation with the formal market through cooperative shops for women and or marketing their own produce in urban spaces. In addition, build appropriate technology that is simple and can revolutionize the small industries. These are schemes that are still used and can make the, the development model more successful. It is important to make development part of the daily resistance against occupation by also exposing the crimes of development that are being practiced by both the occupation, Palestinian government, and some international actors like the World Bank. Historically, current marginalized groups of people have been the real backbone of the economy, and they should revive their role as them only, and them only know the value of a resistance economy, self-reliance that can promote steadfastness. Another alternative is not to accept aid does, that does not respond to urgent problems and needs of the majority of the people or ease their daily problems and retain their national identity and integrity. This can become a valuable asset that can be cherished in history and in the future. It is known that development is not neutral and it is political. So any kind of aid that jeopardizes the national and economic beliefs 
and aspirations of people should not be received. Also, coordinate and ally with different social movements to redefine a realistic approach and appropriate model that can work within the challenges, like research centers, representatives of workers, peasants and specialized NGOs, who can recommend how to go about things. A coalition of activists and collective work can be more difficult to subvert. And lastly, no funding. The need is the mother of invention. The first intifada was not really financed. Different innovative ideas were created, like neighborhood committees, grassroots committees, like education committee, when universities and schools were closed by the occupation for long periods, more solidarity among people, and an informal social safety net. This needs a solid political consciousness and sacrifice as people are not willing to do due to their socioeconomic conditions unless there is a leadership that is transparent, not corrupt, democratic, and secular, who can mobilize people on the basis of national interest and social justice. Thank you. Aline, thank you very much for this very great um, presentation and the very coherent picture you uh, have provided us. I think it was very impressive to see how you could bring together different processes which actually affect and uh, limited women's possibility in Palestine. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. And I would like to start with a question which relates actually to the alternatives you have presented. I mean, however we call it, the resistance economy or development for liberation, which have been very successful, I think primarily after the first uprising, if I'm informed, I mean, I'm not a specialist. I would like to know how also the different forces you described, I mean, how did the settler colonialism reacted to this kind of activities? I mean, is that also an important reason why it has not been as successful or as sustainable as it could have been? Because the way you presented it, it sounded really like an alternative and did also um, the PA not recognizing it, do you say that this is also a reaction of, in quotes now, patriarchy? So there were there different processes uh, come together actually to hinder these alternatives to become a more sustainable endeavor? to change actually um, the, the local situation, especially on the ground for the vulnerable people. That's one point I would like to ask. The other aspect is women's movement. I wonder whether you could say uh, something more about, um, I think you always use the plural. I assume that there are more organizations which you would subsume under the term women's movement, women, move, uh, women movements. I would like to know a little bit more about who are the main actors here and um, whom are they actually representing and how much has this actually changed during the time period you presented us. So thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, how did the how did Israel and the PA respond to these alternatives? Yes, uh, taking just an, one example of the cooperatives, which have been mainstreamed in the West Bank and even in Gaza Strip after the split between West Bank and Gaza, the Israeli military raided all cooperatives and closed them. Now, why? It's not only because of the economic issue. Of course, we, the, the cooperatives, although on a limited scale, have, reprodu have produced alternative goods, 
from by uh, national goods and they boycotted the israeli you know of course goods now this was one political issue but at the same time they have started to realize that women have been empowered not just economically but they have also addressed their social issues and they became more integrated in the national liberation struggle so women through the cooperative as a tool of, for change have become a threat to the colonial setting i mean because mm. not only that because it has also revolutionized the communities the local communities so women were more visible they became more represented in different committees at the village level because most of these cooperatives were in rural areas mm. due to the uh, issue of the confiscation of agricultural land so this is how the occupation you know responded on the other hand the pa the palestinian authority has marginalized further these cooperatives and these alternative projects you know they have not supported them at all although we have field work and a survey asking these you know villagers women what are you taking from the palestinian authority are you being supported they said even water they are not permitting us to you know uh, subsidize water because most of the water resources are being confiscated or used by or under the control of israel so the p against this alternative because they are trying to promote the the, the, the neoliberal model mm. which is not based on self sufficiency or self reliance uh, it's more of like dependency and globalization mm. so i think they are very contradictory uh, contradictory models mm. that both of them would not you know accept to support i mean most of these i should say most of these cooperatives and and projects have been i as i said either closed by the israeli occupation or weakened by the palestinian authority so i mean it's a weak movement now i cannot say that it's flourishing it's a weak movement now it needs some seeds of encouragement which is not yet ripe at this moment i mean with the alienation of the political process with the corruption with i mean the the the, the marginalization of our real aspirations national aspirations people are alienated they don't want to be part of any struggles they are very depressed and frustrated with all what's happening around so i guess now especially that the, the palestinian authority is trying to revive the peace process again people are more and more you know taking a back seat they need a new leadership really to really mobilize the you know the the women and the, the youth and the workers and the peasants to mobilize them again and give them more confidence that they can make a difference if they all work together the problem is we don't have a leadership yeah this is the stage that we can say that we don't have a leadership now the leadership is very busy with elections which may not happen also we don't know and the the grassroots the masses are left alone to deal with their own struggles and the own needs of their daily life so that's the first question <laughs> i think thank you <clears throat> now the second question i couldn't listen to all of this uh, of its parts but i think it is regarding the women's movement mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it is it is very sad uh, that 
to see the women's movement so scattered and fragmented, especially that now is the need, the real need and urgent need for women to collectively work together to be able to not just mainstream gender in the ministries. I mean, you know, we don't want really, yeah. uh, <laughs> that's not our aim, is to mobilize really women on the grounds to build their grassroots organizations. This has not become the real aim and goal of women's movement. Some of them who were against Oslo are still working on that level, but due to the absence of their funding or support, they're very weak. They're not making an effective change. On the other hand, the elite leadership of the women's movement who has started this, these professional NGOs are nourishing, but at the same time, more, I mean, more interested in advocacy and women's rights, but handling women's rights in a vacuum. Because, I mean, women's rights are part of human rights. Yeah. And all human rights are being violated yeah. in different degrees by the Palestinians mm -hmm. and by the colonialists. Yeah. So, I mean, how can you talk about women's rights or gender rights when there is no social justice, when there is no state, when there is no legal framework that can protect these rights? I mean, everything is absent, but the international aid that has transformed the agendas from local to international and have alienated these agendas and women professional NGOs have expanded so much that they are so dependent on foreign aid that makes, they compete also with the grassroots. Mm. So this makes it very difficult for, to transform, I mean, these, uh, you know, these dynamics, let me say it this way. So the elite leadership is also in a dilemma now yeah. because they are being discriminated against. They are being marginalized in the political process. When, you, when we look at the percentage of women in the cabinet, which does not exceed 11%, this says a lot that women with all the sacrifices and the national liberation struggle have not been represented. So it seems that there should be a change and there are certain seeds of change mm -hmm. as even the Institute of Women's Studies is trying to do some kind of networking to discuss and reform, reformulate the women's movement to become more effective at the same time to try to slide, find the balance between national liberation struggle and at the same time, the gender concerns. The problem with that is there is a neglect on the national liberation struggle as if we are in a post-conflict situation. Okay. And that's what the aid, the international aid has done. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're the handling issues of post-conflict situations, but not the conflict situation. So I think there should be a real uh, dis discussion among the women's movement and other movements, yeah. social movements, to you know, uh, try to see how can we go back to the roots, not yeah. only focus on the national struggle, but also see how can we integrate gender concerns in the national struggle, because also gender is important. We yeah. are not Algeria. We are not Algeria. <laughs> no, we don't. Want, we don't want to go back to the kitchen after okay. liberation. <laughs> so, yeah. how can we, yeah. you know, join hands on yeah. both levels is an important process. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aline. There's a question regarding the COVID-19 crisis and how this might affect 
the labor market from a gender perspective in Palestine, but it may be also to uh, how does is there do you do you see any might there any positive outcome of the crisis as well? The crisis, the pandemic crisis. The pandemic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, we don't have studies to really yeah. reflect on that. But the, the, I mean, originally when we talk about the labor, the labor market, it's in crisis all the time because of uh, the change of the economy. I mean, there is large percentage of unemployment. Sometimes it's 40 percent, and poverty has risen a lot too. So the labor market is in crisis itself even before the pandemic. Mm. So post-pandemic, more workers have gone to the Israeli labor market. Now the Israeli labor market is accepting more workers because their workers don't want to work in certain sectors like the construction. Our workers are very skilled in the construction sector. So what's happening is they are vaccinating them and taking them to their own markets. On the other hand, agriculture, as we said, have marginalized all agricultural workers, and particularly women. So agriculture is, is not an employment sector anymore. In the service sector, I mean, women, especially women, are working, as we said, in the public sector mainly. And in certain sectors like the banking sector, as clericals, I mean, you know, as very low uh, uh, you yeah. know, levels of work and jobs. Uh, in, in other service sectors like ho but hotels or whatever. But the problem is that the pandemic has closed everything. We still... The West Bank does not have vaccination, nor West the Gaza Strip. I mean, very limited vaccinations have arrived. So I think there is a paralysis of the economy, mm -hmm. which means that there's more poverty, there's more unemployment. So we can't talk about women in this context. Mm -hmm. You know, women's uh, participation is only, it, it never exceeded 18%. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah. the male breadwinner, I mean, in our culture, is also not working mm -hmm. and losing the salary because the Palestinian Authority, even in the public sector, is only paying 40% of the salary. Mm -hmm. So all this would be in expanding the phenomena of poverty and unemployment. And of course, uh, I think it's not, it's similar to other countries, of course, but it's here it's more deeper because yeah. originally it is weak. But, but could this be an opportunity for the models or the alternatives to mention yes. before? Yeah. Because also the uprising and the political and economic result of the uprising was the reason why this development for liberation, the resistance right. economy developed. I mean, in any case, could this be also an opportunity to mobilize differently again and to think about alternative models again? Yeah, of course. I mean, there are sectors of the women's movement and not only the women's movement, but the student movement, which is trying to revive the voluntary work as a concept yeah. and practice to reach communities. Mm -hmm. The student movement uh, is also in a dilemma because they're trying to address their issues within the educational sector, which has become also problematic. I mean, at the same time, they're trying to continue their struggle and the national struggle. So this dilemma is all over the social movements, of course. Yeah. Now with the crisis, the popular committees that are in villages are starting to go back to the alternative development models. The problem is they need some support of the yeah. Palestinian Authority. Yeah. Why? Because sometimes they, cannot, they will not give them the permit to either dig a well, a water well, 
they don't give them the license to do that. One, this is one problem. Or choose the land and plant it because it's either a border on the borders, which means that for security reasons, the Israelis will stop it. Yeah. You know. So what what needs to be done mm. is like a, you know an expert group yeah. that puts the map okay. of West Bank and Gaza yeah. and work on it. Yeah. There is a real opportunity to come back to these alternative yeah. models, not only by women, yeah. but by all mass-based organizations, yeah. because they are very thirsty yeah. for such opportunities. Yeah. Maybe this question by Helmut fits very nicely into what you just discussed. He asked how the alternative models you mentioned Uh, can be used regionally as well as uh, for Palestinian communities and and how it could also be... Uh, I can't hear you, Petra. I oh, can't okay. hear you. How the activities inside Palestine could be connected to Palestine communities outside Palestine as well. So yes. Yeah. yeah. Of course, the borders are closed now. <laughs> Usually, we have groups that go to other refugee camps in Jordan and Lebanon and transfer their experience and at the same layer learn from their experiences. But at the same time, now with the social media, of course, with the internet and all that, there is uh, more collaboration between especially refugees. Why? Because The Palestinian Authority is not talking about the right to return. Mm -hmm. You see, this is one of the problems of the Palestinian Authority. They don't want to mention it because this will really frustrate the peace process. So what is happening is now there are groups that are lobby, lobbying for the right of return and the right of the, the Palestinians outside to be part of the elections which the Palestinian Authority still does not agree about. Mm. So there is some kind of movement. At the same time, there is a movement between the West Bank Gaza and the 1948. As you see now, you observe that there is a, a real, uh, you know, unrest in the villages yeah. of 1948. So there is more collaboration between both. Yeah. So, uh, and, and more leaders from the 1948 are also becoming mm -hmm. more viable in our context. So more and more, I guess, Palestinians in the diaspora and in the 48 are linking mm -hmm. to Palestinians under occupation yeah. because now it is very clear that colonial occupation is affecting all lives wherever Palestinians are due to the different agreements that are being held or the different, you know, the Trump uh, accords yeah. that were, which have given a Jerusalem to Israel. Yeah. So uh, on daily basis, Jerusalem is subjected to terror, really. Yeah. Uh, you can see that in the news. Every yeah. day we have, uh, you know, military coming and uh, closing shops and uh, beating yeah. Yeah, young people in yeah. the street and all that. So I think what will happen and what we see is that there is a, a, a new intifada, mm. a new uprising coming, okay. because the subjective and objective conditions are meeting. Mm. The problem with us is that we don't only have occupation. The Palestinian government policies has been weakening our struggle too. So how can you tackle both struggles, but on different degrees, yeah. has become a real burden on the Palestinian people. Eileen, um, sorry for interrupting, but we have two more questions. Oh, um, okay. The last questions, which um, are very interesting, and I would um, shortly uh, read them before we have to close. Uh, we have five minutes more to go. Okay. So um, Rashida Atta asked, um, 
whether you could throw some light on the role of the Arab nations and the UN in the Palestinian situation, I think, which is of course important also when we talk about development, as you did. And uh, Gada Musa asked, what is the contribution of the Palestinian authority to empower women? Is this in the national agenda? Probably because you have shown that it's really not taking up this issue there, the question whether it's um, there are at least maybe some strategies. Yeah. So it's the last two questions that we have to close and we have three, four more minutes, Eileen, okay. for answering it, even though it's a uh, huge questions, but anyhow, maybe, yeah. yeah, you will manage. Uh, I mean, uh, very quickly, the constitution uh, really has uh, many different elements of uh, protection for women, but they are not practiced. That's the problem. I mean, rhetorically, there is a lip service for women's empowerment. Also through the UN and all the different, you know, UN agreements with the Palestinian Authority, the women are being, you know, positioned in the constitution. The problem is with the practice. On the other hand, the Arabs with the normalization, of course, are uh, hurting the Palestinian people very much. They don't support them. They have stopped supporting them, except for, I think Saudi Arabia is paying some salaries for the Palestinian Authority. And that's why we cannot criticize the Palestinian, the, the Arab governments, yeah. because some kind of salaries are coming to the Palestinian Authority. So we cannot really depend on the Arab governments. They're weak. Most of the governments that are, that can be allies with us uh, have their own problems, of course. They cannot, they are in crisis themselves. But yeah. the other rich countries of the Gulf have normalized mainly, most of them have normalized, and the rest will normalize, thinking that Israel can protect them from Iran. Mm -hmm. So in that all context, I think, the Palestinians are losing more and more mm -hmm. because they don't identify with our ambitions. They don't care for the Palestinian people. Uh, one of the Saudis on the social media said, you know, we don't care anymore because you're a headache and we can't keep following your issues, mm -hmm. you know? And I think this is how they feel. That's why they, they went to the Israeli nor okay. uh, normalizing yeah. relationship. So we don't have any hope there. We don't yeah. have it. The only hope is our people. They have to resist, continue resisting yeah. until liberation. I mean, we, don't, we can't depend on anybody else. Yeah, Eileen, thank you very much for your presentation, especially also the discussion, sharing your insights with us. I think it was not very optimistic in the ending now. <laughs> uh, which, of course, is not surprising, thinking about your introduction uh, and uh, describing the situation Palestine and uh, the Palestinian people are in. Thank you very much and thank, thank you. you also very much for the questions. And I hope that um, yeah, the resistance will work out. And I really like the concept of making development as part of resistance. I think that's the, probably the right way to go. And maybe we have to influence and try to lobby also internationally, the international community to support um, the strategies you presented here. Yeah. So thank you very much, Eileen, and thank you very thank much, you. Eadi, and also to everybody who joined this lecture. And we hope, of course, to see you Thank next you, time. Petra. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you, Petra. You have been patient with me because it was a long one. <laughs> thank you, Basil, for yeah. all the support you have yeah. given us. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah. Have a nice afternoon and then we hope to see you in another, hopefully not always, virtual meeting. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.